So where were you born? Where did you grow up? And if you can give us like a visual picture uh, of, of the neighborhood and, uh, and the people that were there, uh, we can start from there. Sure. All right. Well, um, uh, I was born and raised in Beaver, Pennsylvania. A, let's, while we're here, I'm going to talk and I'm going to, so I don't quite know the population of Beaver, but it's not very <laughs> big. Beaver, but we got uh, 4,000, population 4,000. Wow. Not very big. Wow. Uh, it's, a, it's a suburb of Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. Uh, it's maybe about 40, 45 minutes away. And it is just the most picturesque, Norman Rockwell, small town. Everybody knows each other, um, but not in a, um, it, you know, because outside of Pittsburgh is a lot of kind of Rust Belt depression stuff kind of in that region. Oh, okay. But it, it definitely missed my town. Beaver oh. does, is very, very um, comparatively well off. Uh, it kind of uh, weathered the storm of the, 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 the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and it was an amazingly privileged upbringing. We were not, uh, we're not wealthy or at all, but um, we, I never really wanted for anything. Do you remember... Do you remember what your first video game or what was the one that you that you just fell in love with? So um, this is an excellent question. The um, the the best answer to that is probably the original Final Fantasy game for the Nintendo yeah. Entertainment System. And wow. I, you know, you, you, your memories as a kid are, are strange, but I got that game as a you know, I got a Nintendo, uh-huh. and I was maybe five or six years old, and I I don't know how, how or why, but I got. Well, Final Fantasy is a gift. Um, and that's a, like... <laughs> I was going to say, isn't that... Uh, that's pretty graphic. The, 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 well, I mean, it's, it's... I mean, it is. The thing is, it's... I think I learned about sex from that game. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's... <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it was that. I mean, we're, we're fighting goblins or whatever. But it, the point <laughs> is, it's a hard game that, like, even, like, nowadays games are for kids. But, like, then, like, games were brutal. They were... They just decimated you, and you just lost, and you lost, and you lost. So Final <laughs> Fantasy was a complicated game. I got it as a very young kid. And looking back, I have no idea how I was able to actually start it, let alone beat it. So a lot of repressed memories there of how crazy hard that must have been. <laughs> the other thing I remember. So you uh, loved, I mean, the, the, that's a, how do you call that? Like a narrative game? Like, I mean, all the games have narrative, but. I mean, that's what, a, this- I mean that was just more of a traditional uh, role playing game. Then okay, I, role I'm role a big play. fan of those, I guess. Yeah, I to this day. And that yep. very well could have been from, from playing Final Fantasy 1, but I just think they're great games. But yeah, um, in the local grocery store, because, uh, you know, we remember the downfall of Blockbuster Video and Hollywood Video. Right. Well, before they existed at all, most of us in, in suburban uh, communities, we rented our video games from uh, local mom and pop shops or grocery stores. Right. And so we would go to the grocery store and I would like pop over like what Nintendo games they have. And they would always have nothing. It was just, I remember like one time, I, just, I haven't thought about this. So the grocery store, you could be like, I want uh, Snickers, like Milky Way and that game. Is that, is that I mean, Well, they had the counter. Yeah, I guess, you know, like you go to customer service or whatever. Right, and right, they right. The thing, other games you look at. Yeah, I remember this would have been, oh, geez, late 80s, early 90s. I went to the Giant Eagle in Rochester, Pennsylvania, and they had two Nintendo games in stock. They had many more that were just out, but mm-hmm. they had uh, Othello. They had Taboo, this is, which was like a fortune-telling game, which was just basically a magic eight ball oh, in a Nintendo game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so and, I, that uh, was the, I would just have this distinct memory of like, wow, Giant Eagle is not very good <laughs> at, for heaven. So you knew you were getting screwed, even back then. I mean, pr- the thing is, because at the shelf, they had these, this great big shelf and then two games, like yeah. emptiness, just vast nothingness. <laughs> and then two games, which are clearly everyone else wanted the other ones. I'm, I'm, I'm like six. I don't know. I don't know what the other ones are, but they they were wanted. They're gone, and now there's just the two left there. And I remember so thinking that's funny. That, yeah. that was talk about how people live now, but scarcity. You really felt it back then. <laughs> you were saying that you played a lot of a lot of uh, video games. Uh, did that take up a lot of the time? Like you're after after school, you come from school and you jump and play a video game, or were they? Yeah, other? no, that was that. Uh, not, that was uh, until late in high school. Uh, I was not very social. Mm-hmm. I was not 
very popular. School was a very big drag. Uh, and I loved video games. So, you know, there's a sad element to the story of like, oh, the kid had to play video games because, you know, high school was, was rough. But I genuinely loved video. I mean, I do yeah. now. But yes, yeah. that was a huge... Like, uh, I struggled to think of anything uh, more impactful in kind of where I am today professionally, as yeah. well as what I do like recreationally than just a childhood full of video games. So anyways, you graduated from high school and you ended up going to, where, where did you go afterwards? So I went to the DigiPen Institute of Technology, okay. which is a unique school. We'll get into that in a second, um, in Redmond, Washington, which is okay. maybe about uh, 20 minutes east of Seattle. It's where Microsoft is uh, headquartered. So and, across uh, and, across uh, the states, from Pennsylvania yeah, to Washington. About as far as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so in, for context, uh, this was in 2001, mm -hmm. and um, I was, I'm very, one of the, I'm a pretty fortunate guy, a lot of privilege, and one of the ways in which I have privilege is the, all I ever wanted to do was make video games, and I also love computers, and so you can, you can contribute to making a video game in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm just going to be a computer programmer and, and work on video games. It was just a, a thing that I would love to do. And it just so happened, this was luck more than anything else. It's a great career. There's just tons of opportunity. Um, you know, if, you, yeah, if, you're, if you're in tech and you're a talented programmer, um, you, you could write your own job description and it's amazing. So um, I wanted to do this. I, and I kind of was like, all right, this is, I'm not going to join the military. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm, I'm going to, option one and that's it. Yeah. And uh now, if you've got, you know, younger listeners or folks with kids, uh, to do what I did, you have a thousand and one very good options. You can go, like, I think there's a lot of very reputable public and certainly fancy private schools that have computer science programs or computer engineering programs that are, you know, well-established with amazing professors. And then in recent decades, they've added uh, video game stuff. But in 2001, there wasn't a lot of legitimate options and kind of generally accepted really good academia. Mm -hmm. So you could go to like a couple uh, fly-by-night for-profit deg you know, degree mills. How was the experience there? Was it, was it a small school? or? Um, uh, so we have, uh, if, if this was a three-hour conversation, I would dedicate an hour <laughs> and a half <laughs> to the college experience at this weird, unlike any other thing in the, in the universe. So I'll give you the abbreviated version, but know <laughs> that it is really abbreviated. Um, I, by and large, from like a college, I'm age 18 to 22, um, yeah. it was an awful experience. Just the, just the pits. I had, I had a terrible, terrible time, but it was super valuable and I'm super glad I did it. So. Wow. The, the college environment, it wasn't. Um, there, it was like a corporate office. It was like a bad corporate office. It was just, um, you know, you beep your badge in and like go up the stairs and there's a receptionist and then go in past these bland, bland hallways <laughs> with all these other people working on stuff. So no campus? Not really. It was the second floor. Now there kind of is. Like the school yeah. has grown, but um, not really. It was the second floor of a, it was next to a 7-Eleven. It, right, it was right near, like, all, like, the, you know, 10 feet away from where the biggest innovations at Microsoft and yeah. the software technologies. It's yep. a cool location, but, like, the campus itself, the experience, terrible. Right. Uh, like, no cafeteria to start with. Like, they brought in catering. It was very strange. It sounds like a school started by a programmer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt. No doubt. It started out like, I think it was, yeah, the art school. It's very for, functional. It's, like, yeah. operational. It's, like, all right, let's be efficient. And you don't need that. We don't need that. Let's just stick to this. Uh -huh. Yep. And uh, it was super duper hard. Our professors had no idea how to, like, teach kids. And it was overtuned as in, in gaming terms. However, a huge part of it, and if there's any bursars out there, whoever's putting together college curriculum, um, I would take 10 times as terrible a college experience I had, uh, and it would still be worthwhile because cooked into every single year of our, my four-year program was a dedicated project class. And I, how it worked in theory, and this mm -hmm. was, uh, had a big benefit, um, which helped um, in, immeasurably, was in the first year, you would learn these technologies with this software, with this math and whatever. 
And then you had a class dedicated to just doing those things and so utilizing these skills that you had developed in your other classes in making a commensurate level game on a team. So wow. first, first year, you'd make like a very basic, we're just figuring out life and it wasn't very interesting, but all the way to the senior year uh, where you made uh, a full-blown game. With so it started from your first year and you had till senior year where at the end of this four-year process, you would actually come out with a game. That not, you- ju- not just one, four. <laughs> we made a game year number one, oh. two, three. Oh. But I'll say this, by the, like, the fourth one, that was the real one. Because we like, they're just, this is just yeah. one class. Trial and error. Also. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, I, we're jumping around a bunch because we'll get back to me. But there's a, a game, I don't know if you... Uh, Portal. I don't know if you've heard of Portal, the game. Portal. Yes, yeah. I, I, this yes is, I have. This is a super popular game. There's now been a couple of them. This is you know, it's a mm-hmm. chart is one of the, one of the best games of all time. Portal was a senior project at my school. No, it, it was. I mean, it wasn't called that. It was called Nerbucular Drop. It was made by a not my group. This was this was a, a different group. Uh, they made uh, basically the the prototype for Portal. And we had a career day, and Valve Software, one of the most uh, prestigious and well-regarded uh, game companies in the world, came in for career day, saw yeah. that they had created this, these students with no pay or anything had created this game, and then hired them on the spot. They hired the team, said, come yeah. over here and make Portal. And they, they hired a, a separate comedy writer, and then they made one of the, the best games of all time. The crux of my college experience and how it, it, it brought, brought us to today was you had to work on four different teams on an end-to-end project by the time you're 22 years old. And we're all idiot college kids full of problems. <laughs> yeah. And I'm the worst defender of all. I, I'm sure I was a terrible person to be on a team. Yeah. But this was a, a hugely important skill to be, like no one masters it ever, but working on a team with like, that guy's not carrying their weight. That guy has no idea what's going on. <laughs> right. That, that guy's working 10 times harder and making some awesome stuff, but he hates talking to people. Right. <laughs> and working in that environment, in a college environment, before I had to, uh, like... Go do, off to the real know, world. Yeah. yeah, oh my God. I, I paid for itself in gold. That, that horrible, that awful experience. That is an awesome program. Are they still doing it? Do you know if they still do that? Oh, yeah. DigiPen is, is bigger and better than ever. Um, that said, they're no longer alone in this. And I, 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 they certainly do the team stuff and that's certainly still viable. And like they're, they moved head, headquarters are still in, um, in, in the, Seattle. Yeah. They're still East side of Seattle. Uh-huh. But, um, fortunately for everybody, they're not the only game in town anymore. Like Digipen is still fine. Um, in my, in many cases more than fine, but what I just described is not unique to one tiny school in the Pacific Northwest anymore. You got a lot of options now. How you, you had mentioned, so after, after graduating from this school, what your next move, where, where did you go afterwards? So um, this, this is like how much to go into detail. I actually, I later finished, but I did actually drop out. Oh, I, The school was so hard and I was such a poor student and not, I did not take to programming very well, uh, nearly as well as I, I had in like high school Yeah, um, that I dropped out. Uh, just a couple of classes shy because they were incredibly hard classes and I just couldn't, couldn't get it together. And for a time I actually played poker for a living. Uh, it just with the, I, I was riding the internet poker craze right as it was like building in, um, I guess this would have been late 2005, early 2006. Um, poker kind of exploded in 2004 ish. Um, and it's not quite as, as big as it was, but for a while there, uh, it was the Wild West, and I was uh, making money hand over fist playing wow. internet poker. Yeah, it was, it was. I remember the first weekend I tried it. I was like, why did I even go to school? This was stupid. I should have just done <laughs> internet poker the whole come time. Here. Yeah, I, was, I can't believe I have student loans. It's dumb. Oh, but did I, you, what did your parents, what did your parents think? They, they, no, my family was not super happy, but this was not, I'm quitting school to play poker. This was, I'm quitting school. I've gotten most of the education. I am just burnt out. I poker's a I need thing I'm time. doing. Exactly. Like I'm I'm doing poker now and like it's great. Um, but this, I cannot do the school thing right now and like I'm not, you know, uh, knee deep in doing heroin speed balls or anything. Right. So they, were, they, were, <laughs> they were mostly fine. Right, right. So and uh 
So you were doing poker and that lasted for some time or what? So yeah, I did it for about, I don't know, about six months a year and it was, it was great, but it was not, everyone's experience different, but I was very unhappy. Um, it was not like a good lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It was not, uh, something I was really, um, into. And, um, a guy that I had met at a, um, an actual physical casino. Most of my poker was online, but I would go to the casinos here in in, uh, the Pacific Northwest. I met a guy who was a pit boss at one of the card rooms. I believe it was the silver dollar in Renton. And I, he became my friend. We were friends. You make poker friends. And he had sent me a text six months or a year into poker. And he said, Hey, I'm, if I'm at, uh, I'm at Microsoft now. And like, I know that you, um, like you, you did computer science stuff, but and our team is hiring. Like, is that something you'd be interested in doing? And I said, well, yeah. And it was, it was very, it, and he, if he had asked like three months earlier, I'd be like, no, of course not. I'm going to do poker for the rest of my life. This is the best <laughs> life in the world. But he asked after I had been doing it and after like, I was not really having a great time. And so I went in and I interviewed and I got my first job at Microsoft uh, through a guy I knew at a casino. No way. And, uh, and then I was there in, in several jobs for seven years at, at Microsoft. And, and you just jumped right to it. And did you have to, on the, on the run, learn a lot of things also through programming, the stuff that you were having trouble with or not? I mean, <laughs> or it was very different? No, we'll get there. Yeah. So um, first I started off as a, what's called a product feedback analyst. And this was kind of a lower skilled thing, but it was perfect for my life at the time. But I was in a team of all sorts of program managers and all sorts of skilled people. And our team was building out uh, like a miniature software development group. Mm-hmm. And they like from nothing. And so somebody somewhere said, hey, does anyone know how to do software de- uh, programming? I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at it. <laughs> yeah. thinking, thinking I was at least passable. <laughs> Uh, and like, and we, and I got, um, I became a full-time Microsoft employee and, and started my first full-time job after a couple months. And I was a software design engineer, um, on a team of two. And, um, <laughs> then I, it became acutely aware that I am not a very good software engineer. <laughs> like uh, Between I was, your team of two. <laughs> yeah. I was not a good student, but I thought like, okay, maybe I'm a good programmer, um, when I'm a yeah. better student, cause like I'm mature, yeah. I'm, I'm growing as a, as an adult and as a professional. Right. Um, but there's a lot of skills with software development that I enjoy doing, but I'm just not, um, world-class. Right. And so our team began growing and how this is very organic. You see this in every company in the world, every role in the world. When there's two people, everyone does everything. Right. And then whenever you hire more and more people, you become more and more specialized. And we hired more people as the team grew. And as you know, we had more software stuff to do. They're like, well, we're not giving it to Nate. Obviously. <laughs> right, right. Get someone else. Yeah. But I, be, I am a pretty talented, turns out, um, what we call it Microsoft Program Manager, uh-huh. uh, which is kind of in the greater universe Product Manager. Yep. And some people call project manager, but that's a different thing entirely. So everyone calls it a little bit of different stuff. So I basically carved out a career for myself in software, uh, both at Microsoft and then later at Electronic Arts, um, as a product manager and kind of um, leader of strategic stuff, uh, but certainly not programming. I, I, uh, I'm not that, very... That's so cool how life is, right? That you, you learn a certain skill set, you might not be great at it, but there's another skill set that you might have that you, you don't even know that you have. And the original skill set that you were not so great at, that's the one that helps you leverage the other skill set. So like you knowing about programming, not having to be the best at it, but knowing about it, allow you to actually speak the language with anyone else that came in and be able to manage them, but do it in a much better way. That's, that's really cool. It, you're, you're so right. And I'll add one thing. Being bad at software development wasn't a wholly negative thing because in these conversations, when we're talking developers and they're talking about, you know, something that is particularly challenging, I know in what ways these things are challenging all mm-hmm. too much. Yeah, but many, right. <laughs> many people in my, in my posi- uh, past position of, you know, kind of managing the, the tasks of software team, when yeah. problems arise, it's like, just do it. Just figure it out. I don't care. I'm too, I know, I don't know what's going on. But me from like, oh yeah, I remember that problem. I didn't know how to fix that either. I remember trying to fix that once and I broke all this other stuff. So yeah, <laughs> I, I hear you loud and clear. 
<laughs> right, right. When when you made the transition to electronic arts, which is the that's the mecca for 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 games, right? I mean that that's one of the biggest players, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a massive uh, company. Um, they've sometimes they're really popular, sometimes they're really unpopular, but they are a, a juggernaut. And they've been uh, around for a while. Oh yeah, since the uh, they're one of the oldest currently operating video companies for sure. Um, and I was very happy to initially go there because it was a very gentle transition. So Microsoft is a large software company. Yeah, Electronic Arts is a large software company. They make very different things. They have different processes, but they're they are more similar than they are different, and that's not not super visible to mm. people kind of outside the, the, the tech echo chamber is, you know, one software test engineer at this company versus that company, your day to day or your roles and responsibilities. It's, it's not that different uh, in various places. That's interesting. And what, uh, when, when you made the transition, was that you applying or did you end up finding another uh, poker player that, <laughs> <laughs> That introduced you. So the, yeah, no, I had been at Microsoft for seven years. Yeah. I, I think I joined them when I was maybe 22 or 23. And I left when I was, I was, th I woke up and I was 30. Yep. And Microsoft is a great employer and I love my team. Everyone on my team, they put up with my nonsense. It was great. Um, but there's a lot of people on my team in their 50s and 60s. And I didn't want to wake up one day and with my... It, yeah, and like with my great thirty years in Microsoft. Or yeah, this is my this is the biggest first world problem you probably ever heard on. <laughs> but like, I was, it was a great job with a great team. But I just you know wanted to see the world and go do other things. Yep. So I, but not so, not so zany. I'm not going to go you know do sculpting in in yeah. East Africa. <laughs> I I just started applying for jobs in the Bay Area. I wanted to do um, ideally something in video games, but. Um, there's, I mean, you're in Silicon Valley. There's right. before Microsoft, sorry, before Amazon mm -hmm. became the, the absolute colossus that it is now. And uh, before Microsoft kind of corrected its curve and became cool again, mm -hmm. uh, Seattle had a bit of an inferiority complex. The, sorry, the Seattle tech community <laughs> has a bit of an inferiority complex based on all the stuff that's going on in California. But in games, isn't Seattle super recognized? Seattle is great. It's, it is. It is. It's almost every company is different. We can paint in tech. We can paint a big brush of this is how tech companies are and in yeah, yeah. San Jose, or this is how they are in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Game companies are a little different in that each game company is a, is a little bit different. Mm. But I will say, like Valve, as, as mentioned before, uh, Nintendo has an outpost here. There's tons of smaller game companies. Seattle is no slouch mm. uh, with its video game offerings, for sure. But the thing is, in, uh, when this was in 2012-ish, mm -hmm. I'm not interested in just joining a good company. I just want to I want to go somewhere else. Yep. I, I just, um, maybe California is a promise and many of my classmates from DigiPen, um, I had been at Microsoft for seven years. Many of them had gone to Northern California, either started game companies or joined game companies. And, and so all my friends are down there and I just kind of want to see what's up. So I, I applied to some jobs. I had some conversations with Google um, and ultimately settled with Electronic Arts because it was games. And when I was at Microsoft, I wasn't actually making games. I was just right. making uh, kind of Windows stuff. Uh, and so I was going to join games. It was the perfect role. I'm uh, like a, a product manager executive. I'm running the, their online services division. Uh, and it was exactly what I wanted. It turns out um, it wasn't what I needed, I guess. Mm. So no uh, um, the... Uh, that is a big question. Let's see if I can uh, break it down. <laughs> yeah. uh, the so when you you're talking about when you joined EA, this then you realize this is what you wanted, but it it wasn't what you needed. Is that yeah, what yeah, yeah. That that is yes. Uh, and to dive in a little bit, mm -hmm. I um, I was on a team where we just weren't as friendly with each other mm. as we were at Microsoft. The, the environment um, was less collaborative and almost in a way competitive. I had read about this where teams inside of companies compete for resources. Mm. And, you know, you kind of have, it generates infighting and there's lots of books written about that. Yep. But I'm witnessing it now firsthand and it was not a super pleasant environment. Um, EA gets a lot of flack and I'll say honestly, EA is, is a company. They treated me just fine. It was just that this, the, the 
team that I was on, the dynamic of, you know, competing for resources with other teams, and it was kind of the zero sum game. Yeah. It was not super pleasant. Um, I didn't love the Bay Area as much as I thought I would. I, I really enjoy it now, kind of going back back and visiting. I did not enjoy one bedroom uh, outhouse. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that, which cost, made, I, that I, costs like a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, and now is 3 million since we've been <laughs> right. Out. Right. Would have been a great investment. You should have, you should have bought that. <laughs> you should have bought that. Yeah, and so I, uh, as hindsight is 2020, my friend. Uh, so I was, as I was not, not very long and it became clear that like, it was super, like a lot of people there are happy and it was super fun to be working on stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could go to a, a party or something and they say, Oh, what, what do you do? And I said, oh, I just, I did this thing for battlefield four. And they're like, I love battlefield four. And they talk about all this stuff that, you know, they, they're, they're passionate about it. Right. That was really cool. But I, I was not happy. And right in the midst of my unhappiness, um, came, uh, the concept of escape rooms. Uh huh. So, uh, by way of context, um, now, as we sit here and talk, um, I am the co-founder and CEO of Puzzle Break, and we are the first American escape room company, and I do a lot of talks and lectures and, and interviews, uh, and uh, I have been um, generously given the title, uh, the father of escape rooms. And, what, I, what and, are, and what are escape rooms? So, at its core, good question, at its core, escape rooms are a team activity where a group of friends or strangers or colleagues are locked in a room or trapped in a room uh, or space, mm. and they have to work together to find clues, solve puzzles, and unravel some kind of mystery, usually culminating in an actual escape of the physical room. You find a key, you open the door, you get out and you win. You usually get one hour, win or lose, game is over, uh, and you try and beat the clock. And it's basically doing a video game in real life. That's, it's, it's so funny. I, I ha as I looked at your background, the minute I saw that you had worked in gaming it there is this very strong synergy where you're like oh that's really interesting so you've always loved creating experiences and narratives whether it was like virtually or now through an actual physical environment how how did you even come across escape the escape industry so this was you at this point you're still you're at ea i'm at ea and how did you even come across this? Yeah, and I'm not uh, looking to start a company at the time. It's just I'm unhappy at my job. Right. So there's two elements here. One, um, escape rooms, they're not without not that terminology, but they used to be called adventure games. These were video games where you did what I just described, but digitally. Uh, and these were very popular in kind of the, they started in the late seventies. They kind of exploded in the eighties and kind of early nineties. It's a real renaissance of amazing video games where you do what I just described in a video game, games like Myst, M Y S T. That was uh, right. for a time. That's the best selling computer game of all time. For, oh my for a while. God. Right. I remember that game. Myst is like an escape Island. We, uh, in these point and click adventure games, uh, secret of monkey Island, Grim Fandango. These are games, mm. uh, all the Zork series. Uh, that I always loved. I always played these things growing up. Big fan, played all these games. So I knew that they existed, and I certainly knew why they were fun. I certainly knew how to kind of craft them and, and, and really how to leverage that, that uh, design. Uh, but simultaneously, in uh, 2013, while I was at EA, um, it came across my desk that doing these things in real life uh, was happening in Japan, uh, in I several years earlier, a Japanese magazine company, don't quite know the full history there. Mm -hmm. uh, they started doing like very simple escape rooms in real life uh, in Japan, and then uh, some right around that time, we don't quite know when. Uh, some folks in Eastern Europe, or I guess Central Europe, and uh, Hungary, and um, mm. uh, Czech Republic, and stuff. Mm -hmm. They were doing in you know just basements. These are not entertainment future entertainment juggernauts. They're just, you know, we're making an escape room in our basement and maybe it's fun. So I learned about this and just, it was explosions in my head because obviously I know 
that this is going to take the world by storm. These mm. are the most fun thing in the world to do digitally. Of course, it would be amazing to do uh, in real life. So uh, I was talking to my friend and future co-founder. Uh, she lives, uh, lived at the time in Seattle. I was, recall, in the Bay Area. And we're talking about it. And we're like, oh, man, this would go great in Seattle. Everyone would love this in Seattle. <laughs> Somebody should make this in Seattle. And we was like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's you and me. We're going to make this in Seattle. What, what, what was your friend also in the gaming world or what no, was she up to? She was, uh, she is because we knew right away that this, if this would work, it would be, be the dynamic would help. She is a PhD. She is a professor. Wow. Uh, and so she, uh, and is also like one of the most organized and hardworking people that I've ever met. So she's got a lot of the organizational stuff, but she also loves video games. Like that's not her professional background, but she loves these games just as much as I do. Mm. And um, she has, you know, not just the contemporary storytelling background of I've played all these video games, but you know, she's studied for her whole professional life. The stories that have always been told in, in time and time again in Greece and Rome and, and all the way up through now. It's uh, Dr. Lindsay. What is it? Do, Dr. Name, Do, Dr. Lindsay Morse is my, yes. my co-founder and the Puzzle Break chief creative officer. And so I was like, wouldn't it be great? And we can just, we'll just make this company. We'll see. Well, I don't know. We're not, maybe it'll become the biggest thing in the world, but who cares? Wouldn't it be great if we get into a place where then you can teach for fun and then we're also doing this really cool, awesome right. uh, project. So we didn't, have much of a long-term goal because there's no, um, the, the, the theme, the recurring theme of my career is there's no, um, manual for like what you're going to do. It's, we kind of had to make as we go. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, found a spot in the basement of a random building in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle. There's like, like no windows. So nobody would want it. It's it got like weird pipes in the ceiling. It's a very strange space that, you know, they couldn't charge very much for cause it wasn't very nice. Were they even, were they even surprised that you were interested? <laughs> They're like, wait, I mean, you want this? I remember they asked like, what do you do? And we had to like, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, we're gonna, we're gonna, way, your concept is not easy to explain either. No. When somebody asks you, "What do you do?" No, no, no. We're and gonna people, trap people into a room. Yeah, and landlords don't care for the word "locked in" or <laughs> "trap." They're not fans. <laughs> so, but you know, for the first room anyway, we're just like we're just we're just doing this thing. So we uh, we rented the space, and Lindsay designed and built basically from a, a, a thrift store. Uh, our first room, the uh, first puzzle break room in uh, a matter of weeks and we were up and running. So we were the first American escape room. That was in August of 2013 where we opened the doors. Like we had a website of course, and you could buy tickets, but um, yeah, we didn't know. Uh, yeah, then we made a Facebook page and a Twitter page, but like, like how do you get people to come to something that like doesn't exist? Like how did the first right. movies right. get people to go to the movies? Like come to this movies. Well, what's the movies? Yeah. That, was, that was a challenge we faced. Yeah. So like we, Lindsay and, and we put up flyers and around the city of Seattle. It's like, come to this thing. We, we were very mysterious about it at first. We figured that would be an attractive angle of like, come to this thing. You don't know what it is, but you're going to have fun. And, uh, and you is, know, that how you, is that how you promoted it? That a little bit. So now, um, mm -hmm. when, you, when you go to any escape room in the world, uh, it's like, okay, we're going to escape this uh, laboratory. And there was a zombie outbreak and we got to fix the whatever. And it's all laid out. Maybe there's some pictures. For our first room, we didn't know any better. We're figuring it out as we go. We didn't tell people the theme. We barely told people it was an escape room. It's like, you'll <laughs> find out. Maybe. What if they actually thought they couldn't escape? <laughs> well, we call the cops on you. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot. And even now, this is, you know, the industry is pretty mature. Well, it's maturing. But like five years later, we even now get like, oh, is it like Saw the movie? Like, oh, yes. Is it like the movie where we murder <laughs> the people on the inside? Right. No, it's not scary. I mean, some of them are scary, of course. But our, our games are just more game oriented, more puzzle oriented. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, for I don't I don't remember these exact timetable well we certainly didn't sell a lot of tickets to start surprisingly yeah. uh but then once um we got i think one i can't remember who it was but one or two groups of people that had pretty comparatively high social media followings uh they, in the seattle started. area but, but yeah did you, did you ever find out how they found out about it was it the flyer i, I think it might have been the first the first piece i don't know i i don't know 
Yeah, but pro- flyers were are then and now a disproportionately big part of Seattle entertainment advertising. Like uh, this is not a random thing. Like you go around Seattle, there are flyers for stuff to do everywhere. Right, music, so the, scene, yeah. like the concerts or whatever. Uh, we actually we had a puzzle break room in San Francisco for a year. And I tried flyering and San Francisco was not having that at all. That was just not, that was not their, their culture at all. Right. But yeah, in Seattle, I think the flyers did some work. And then yes, yeah, some, like some prominent game personalities, some folks that like, I think they worked on magic, the gathering. They were like, you got to go to puzzle break now. Cause there was nothing like it in the country. I'm guessing it was you. Who's the curator? It was, it was primarily Lindsay. Cause recall at the time I'm living and working at electronic arts. Oh, right. We, we didn't, this is, we made a very, like I, now I, I give a lot of entrepreneur talks and I, I get a lot yeah. of cred that maybe isn't fully deserved on account of, we made very little risks. We took very few risks. Uh, um, I kept my job right, right up until it was clear that I could qu- easily quit. Um, Lindsay loves teaching. And so she kept teaching. Right. But so um, at this stage in the business, I'm still in California. So she's running these games up in the Seattle area. But you figured out how to set up a prototype. Oh, yeah. You, you, you put together a prototype super quick. How long did it take? You it, said- it was super quick. It was not a high-quality room in terms of the fit and finish. But no, I would say Lindsay did uh, most of the work at that time. Um, but it was um, from the moment we're like, we should do this, to the moment like tickets were for sale for that first group. It was, yeah. no, it was no more than two months. It was wow. very, very fast. Wow. And now, like, if you like, come see our Puzzle Break experiences now, that's absolute malarkey because our rooms are, like, huge budgets and they take years to fully design and do the tech for. But then we didn't know, like, there, you didn't need to do tech. You didn't, we're figuring it out as we go. So we did the, the, the thrift store stuff. So you had these first two groups and, and you're seeing that it, the continuity, that the, they had a good experience, but you weren't seeing any, any difference in, in terms of more people coming in originally? Yeah, they, I mean, they were, they were having the, the time of their lives. We, from the moment the first group played, we knew that this was, like, I, I strongly suspected that escape rooms would take over the world. But when I saw the first group play, like with my own eyes, I knew that escape rooms would take over the world. Wow. It's just a matter of getting there. Right. So at the time, uh, this, we're entirely self-funded. We've never had investors. We've never had any debt. It's just the first bit was out of our pockets. And then um, subsequent growth has been just reinvesting back in the business. How much did you end up spending for the... $7,000 was the initial investment. Wow. And now we are, um, we're a seven-figure company. That's amazing. We've got uh, locations in New York and Massachusetts, and we've got several games um, across the Royal Caribbean fleet. You can play Puzzle Break games on uh, Royal Caribbean. I want to get to that one after after we... I, I want to know, so you saw it, you, they're having a blast, but then one of the problems was that they're having a blast, but you're still not seeing kind of a, a big pickup, or were they having a blast and immediately you saw something? We, it went from no, we started with no pickup, I'll say. Like we had a couple groups who saw the flyers and presumably Lindsay or I would just talk their ear off at a party saying, get your friends and go to a puzzle break. We'll give you a discount or something like that. <laughs> right. Um, so there was, it was, it was flat, didn't really go anywhere, didn't go down, but everyone had a great time until I, I believe it was about two groups uh-huh. who had uh, members with followers, got it. as well as um, we got a little piece later in um, like the local Capitol Hill, not the Seattle magazine, but like the, the little blog for the Capitol Hill neighborhood uh-huh. wrote about us and that got picked up in a bunch of places. And so then it, it kind of exploded. And so a lot of things happened kind of very quickly. I left my job at EA uh, and Lindsay, I, I think she pulled back the teaching. We got a second location in that same building. We built our second room. Uh, and it just kind of spiraled from there. Uh, we, as of now, um, I guess we have six rooms or so in the Seattle area. Um, I don't know offhand what we have in New York and Massachusetts, but we are constantly building and, and developing new rooms. So tell me about this Royal Cruise. I read something that it was a million dollars, something like that, the room. So we have um, a Royal Caribbean, the current fleet size, I want to say is about 26 ships. Uh-huh. And as, as we talk now, uh, we have puzzle break games of one form or another from paper-based large scale games to dedicated escape room, uh, extravaganzas on about 10 or 13 of those. Wow. Uh, with more on the way and how this started as I cold called them. This is like the classic entrepreneur wow. story oh, of my favorite. Yeah. In 2014, like, escape rooms kind of started exploding in about 2016. 
Yeah. Ish is kind of when we started to see uh, some maturity. So this is in 2014. We've been doing it for a year. Mm-hmm. There's only about 10 in the country, maybe. And I cold called some cruise companies because I knew I, I love cruising as a, like a, that's yeah. something I enjoy doing, uh, that this is a perfect environment uh, for a, a cruise ship. We'll totally. make some friends. Well, it's something to do. We can, yeah. you know, it's good for all ages. And so I cold called some cruise companies and I said, you, you need this thing. You've never heard of this thing. You need a puzzle break room on your ship. Let's talk about it. That's a hard, that's, that's still, it's so funny because when you hear it and obviously now that it happened, you're like, yeah, of course, I could totally see that. But that's a hard sell to, to talk to somebody, especially if they've it never was. heard of, of uh, game rooms, escape rooms, I mean, and tell them like, we're going to, it's going to be a little bit scary and they need to figure out how to get out of a room. You know, and they're like, what? You want us to do what to our guests? Like, yep. It was, and so I, I wrote the email in exactly the way that I knew I, cause I was an executive at EA that yeah. would get me to read it. <laughs> uh, so like I had a little bit of an ace in my sleeve, but that, as you pointed out, it's hardly enough. Uh, and it was just a, uh, one of those magical moments where the, the incoming is, is new to the job, uh, vice president uh-huh. of entertainment, uh, at Someone Rope willing Caribbean. to take risks. He's willing to take risks, but he's also, I mean, like he is a visionary. Like he got it. He's he, mm-hmm. like, he came from, he didn't know what escape rooms were. He read the line and was like, I kind of get it. He got it immediately. I guess that's why they get, pay him the big bucks. And he's the vice president of entertainment. That's and awesome. with, within a week we were on a phone and within two weeks we were planning a pilot game wow. where we would go out and do like a temporary escape room for like them and right. their captains and see if they liked it. And we did it for their grumpy captains at a grumpy conference that nobody wanted to be at. <laughs> and they had a great time. And then it, it grew from there. So we did our first temporary room, then our first big budget room. And so now it's a huge operation. Um, we have um, dedicated fabrication stuff. We have, um, yeah, these things are cost a, a absolute truckload of money. And they're the nicest things you can find anywhere. And it all goes back to a cold call that I made in 2014. What's some advice or some, some, some lessons that you like to share with, with people that are trying to figure out what they want to do, uh, whether it's in the gaming world or whether it's uh, wh- wherever, wherever their passion takes them? Are there certain things that you come across that were very helpful for you and, and you like to share for, uh, for everyone else? My first piece of advice, which worked out really well for me, so I am a little biased. Yeah. But it's just do it. Just do it. Like, okay, I'm going to work on this, this, um, uh, this game, and, but I need funding t- in order to get the really fancy um, 3D <laughs> artists to make the awesome models. Right. Shut up. Do that later. Make the game now. Start making it now. Like, figure out, like, this is fun. This is not fun. And, and eventually, when, when you're ready, cross that bridge when you come to it. I love that. There's a, there's a million and one reasons to not do anything in business and in life. Uh, So you get hung up and it's like, "Ah, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. It's kind of scary. As long as it's not super risky. Like I'm not advising people go, um, you know, yeah, go climb a mountain without a safety harness or anything, but with regard to, you know, in, in software and in most business, just do it, do it and see how it works. Do it in a low risk way, position yourself to do an MVP or minimum viable product. Um, and, uh, go from there. Maybe you, you've, you've tapped greatness. Maybe you struck gold the first time. Maybe you're in the completely wrong direction and you've learned that lesson of like, oh, no, I hate this or this isn't going to work in this marketplace. So the sooner you do it, just, just do it. Just, just do it. I love it. I'd say wait to the end of listening to this podcast or watching this video and then do it. <laughs> uh, and then the second bit, and mm-hmm. I have been lucky and I've watched a lot of people uh, be not so lucky is a lot of people's passion lies in areas that do not have a lot of money. Uh, associated with the ultimate product or the business. And that's so fine. We get caught up all too much of like, ah, oh, your business is stupid. You're, you know, the market is too small. Well, mm. if it's somebody's passion, that's a different story. Mm. So my second piece of advice is follow the passion. Don't be afraid if it's in an area that is maybe not the best suited financially to kind of, um, you know, make you retire early or, right, even, you know, take right. care of your family as is now. But the other side of that coin is don't abandon the, uh, the very don't drop real it situation. So quickly. Yeah. And I would say like, even beyond that, um, let's say that my passion lied with something that just makes no money. I wouldn't, obviously I wouldn't drop my job so quickly, but I would 
position myself mentally in a place where I will pursue this dream and I will pursue it as hard and as fast and as fully as I can, but I will also keep my day job or keep my, subs- my membership to this professional organization or be in a mental place where I know that I'm going to have to spend at least 15 hours a week pouring coffee in order to enable this dream. And I, I mentioned this because I, this is not directly related to anything with me, but too many of my friends in the creative space forgot that part. Like, I am just going to go paint. Uh, and then by the time they realize that, you know, oh, there's rent isn't going anywhere. Right. Um, they've like f- screwed up the painting situation or the yep. whatever, you know, business for dogs or whatever. So uh, not, not balancing it forces you to give up on something that you could have been, uh, that you are very passionate about, but because you set yourself up for, it's almost like setting yourself up for failure in oh, yeah. what you're sharing, where it's, you know, pursue it, pursue it in a balanced way, make sure you're protected. But at the same time, because you have some form of income that allows you to continue giving it a shot and, and learning and trying, trying out whatever it is that you're passionate about. Yep. Absolutely. And you know, there are times it's like, I can't dedicate myself to this job or this craft or this, this industry without quitting this job. Okay. But keep those folks in your Rolodex. And then it's very easy to be like, Oh, this didn't work out. Go right back to this thing. And you're, you've, you've learned so many lessons and you're no worse off than when you started. That's great. Anything that we, uh, we didn't cover you want to cover the, uh, I guess the big parts is if anyone needs to get a hold of me, Ah, yes. Um, I, uh, so my company is Puzzle Break. We're the first uh, escape room company. Um, we're headquartered in Seattle with a lot of locations. Puzzlebreak.com is the website. Uh, I am on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Guy from Tomorrow. <laughs> is probably <laughs> okay. the, best, the best way to get a hold of me. Guy and from Tomorrow. Guy from Tomorrow. And uh, no, I think we covered everything about me. And I would just say that um, as the, proof, pu- uh, the uh, proof is in the pudding. Uh, for the listeners and watchers who have listened to this and like, you know what? I got some questions about what you do or some kind of experience. Absolutely. You've got. I would love to answer them. Find me on Twitter and uh, we'll take it offline. That's awesome. Sounds good, man. Yeah, I you appreciate a, it. Of course. You have a good rest of your day and we'll be in touch.